Hi, and welcome to Digital Innovation for Culture. I'm Sara Angelini from MIT, and I'm going to explain you how our dashboard works. It's divided into three sections. On your left, there's the live stream of the event. At the top right, our live engagement tool, Slido, moderated by Nicola Bruno. You can write down your question and use the poll tab to interact with us during all the event. On the bottom right, there's the live sketching by Marcello Petruzzi, how's a tonic? He visually documents in real time the ideas emerging during the conversation. Feel free to share your question also on our social network, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, moderated by Lorenza De Lucchi. The hashtag of the event is Meet Benayun. Is it right? Well, I give the stage to Maria Grazia Mattei, Meet founder and president. Enjoy the listening. Welcome, uh, nice uh, to be here, it's very nice. So welcome to the Digital uh, Innovation for Culture program, it's our very special format uh, designed to, um, to give more information uh, at uh, our audience, uh, cultural people, to understand what's, what's changed at the, in this moment. But now, uh, we, this afternoon, we are going to discuss with the digital environment with a, a very special pioneer, Maurice Benen. Hi, Maurice. I don't know if you are here. From hey, Hong Kong. Hello, hello, Maurice. Hello, Je suis de te voir. Bienvenue, welcome to, Thank to you. Milano, to the meet. The, a real pleasure. <laughs> it's okay. It's my pleasure because you are our very, very good friends, but you are also a very great artist, a new media artist. Uh, Maurice Benayoun is a media artist, a curator, and also very critical person uh, of the mutation in our contemporary society through the emerging technology. And uh, his work, uh, um, uh, is, he works with the various media, uh, like computer graphics, uh, immersive virtual reality, web, uh, neuro design, uh, 3D printing, interactive exhibition. And uh, we want to discuss with, uh, with Maurice uh, what is uh, uh, now for us, uh, what, what, uh, what, what is what's happened in the art world with uh, this uh, new technology? What is the digital dimension? This is my question. I want to understand with your sensibility what is uh, exactly the world now between virtual and physical reality, okay? So uh, let me tell about MIT. MIT is uh, our um, center, the first international digital center uh, in Italy. Uh, is uh, our focus is uh, uh, the, um, reduce the Italian digital divide, the cultural digital divide, and uh, we organize very many events. Uh, one format is this format with our guest uh, Maurice Benayoun. But uh, um, we want also you have a, a, a also a news because uh, in the next October finally meet will open it facility building uh, at in the middle of Milano. So we are kind of invited to to to, uh, to contact us for invitation because we want to open a virtual and physical tour, finally. And uh, I want to thank uh, also my sponsor because this project, it, 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 uh, there is not possible with uh, uh, if uh, some uh, pa without partner like uh, Fondazione Cari for First, ma also Intesa San Paolo, also Artemide, eh, Fondazione Fiera Milano, Sigest, so any other member, eh, partner, eh, I, I don't remember now at all, but it's very interesting because this project is built with the, the help of uh, our also private industry and the public institution to, institution, institution too. So Digital Innovation for Culture program uh, has been designed uh, to offer contribution Italia, Italian cultural operator to reprogramming 
their activity in this new normal area. Uh, this format, uh, as this virtual program, uh, this virtual program is uh, is um, is uh, uh, has been into three different moments. The first moment is a virtual talk uh, with Nancy Proctor uh, to discuss about uh, the uh, future of a museum, perhaps. Uh, in, in the middle of this program, uh, we organize a virtual charrette with our international partner, Luigi Ferrara, in, uh, in Toronto. And uh, finally, with uh, Maurice uh, at the moment, uh, this, this evening, uh, we, want to uh, uh, we want to discuss, uh, we want to understand the art, the art, the digital art. And finally, for me, it's very important, uh, Maurice, uh, to understand the digital dimension, this world. So, Nicola, Nicola, uh, are you ready uh, to, to lead us in the slide world? Because our format is very, is uh, just a little complex, but it's very interesting, it's a very, very, very participating format. Please. Yeah, thank you, Maragazia. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah, today, too, we are very active on uh, Slido. Uh, Slido is our uh, audience engagement tool. Uh, now we are launching some uh, polls. As you can see, we have asked uh, what city are you wow. are uh, people following us from. We have a very different audience uh, coming connected from New York, Toronto, but uh, also a lot of from uh, Italy. Uh, we have also more than 80 uh, part people who are participating as uh, discussion discussants in our virtual roundtable with Maurice Benayoun. We have asked them to share with us their ideas on the, on the new dimension of uh, virtual and digital arts. And uh, we will continue to moderate the conversation on uh, Slido with the live polls, with the Q&A, and we will try to reply by the end of the lecture with uh, Maurice. Uh, by the way, we are not uh, active just on Slido. We are also available on other channels. We have this uh, multi-stream uh, um, multi stream, right, Lorenza? Nicola, we are multi stream and multi dimensional, I would say. So, hello, everyone. I'm very happy to guide you again on our social media experience on this digital catch up with Maurice. Hello, Maurice. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me quickly show you how it works. It's quite easy. So I'm going to show you our Facebook page and our Facebook page. You can use also Twitter. You can also use uh, Instagram. Please, please feel encouraged to use our, um, let's say, official hashtag that is Meet Ben Ayun, as you can say. And well, I would say that now maybe it's time for us to know more about Maurice and his art and his work. So Maurice Benayoun is a pioneer, a French pioneer and a cosmopolitan pioneer of new media art, a curator. He's a professor at the Creative School at um, the City University of Hong Kong, where he lives. His work explores the boundary, as Maria Grazia says, of uh, art encompassing video and virtual reality, sculpture, interactive art, and media, public installation, and so on. Mo Ben, as is also known, uh, has been widely awarded and exposed in very parts of the world, such as Saint Pompidou, but also the Museum of Contemporary Art in Lyon, Montreal, and also ICC in Tokyo. So, as you can tell, we are going to get a very good expression on media trends and what's the next point, what's the next on the media. As Moses just explained us a few minutes before going online, he said that uh, we'd like to explain us that art is shifting. And I would say, where is art going and shifting to, Maurice? So I give the stage to you, please. <laughs> Thank you very much for this very kind uh, introduction. And uh, thank you, Maria Grazia, for uh, inviting me and, and the Meet and the Foundation Caricou. Um I think it's a great privilege because uh, I appreciate more and more the fact that we give talks like that than people can see afterwards. And, uh, and uh, so we increase considerably uh, the impact uh, of, uh, of our talks. And it's also the possibility to have feedback from uh, 
uh, a wider audience and uh, with a great diversity in terms of uh, origin, locations, and so on. So that's totally fantastic. Um, so uh, maybe I should share my screen to start with. Uh, okay. So if you see my screen, it's a very good thing. And I'm we do. <laughs> Excellent. So uh, yes, I thought about talking instead of uh, only presenting my work uh, in a kind of a historical point of view, uh, I decided to organize uh, my work according to some, some shifts that uh, clearly happen in the media art world and the contemporary art world for the last 30 years. So I started, uh, I started with video, but I'm not talking about that. That was in the 80s. I used to do video installation, and uh, that was quite uh, entertaining. And then I started still in the 80s to work with computer graphics. And so uh, one of the first moves uh, is how uh, we've been going from drawing to CGI computer, computer graphic image. And I work with Francis Coyton and Benoit Peters uh, on the series Quarks. Uh, that was uh, uh, probably one of the very, very first TV series made of computer graphics. And I know it was the first one made of HD uh, computer graphics as well. And so that was the thing. So just imagine starting, in, we started in 88. And so in 91, it got an award at Seagraph. Uh, it, it was the first TV series made of, uh, um, oh, I should have uh, some video here, but uh, it doesn't seem to come. OK, yeah, it's coming. Sorry, not to know that it was coming. So uh, we are in 91, 92. Uh, when this series made of kind of realistic uh, uh, computer graphics was trying to uh, play with the idea of truth and realism. The time and, has come for me to reveal everything I know about quarks. And of course, it was totally unexpected because uh, at this time, computer graphics were mostly These about uh, cubes, spheres, and cones. And this one was telling a complex story about a scientist uh, working on a strange species uh, called quarks that are supposed to be invisible, but also omnipresent. I mean, everywhere around us. And we discover afterwards that the they quarks explain why the past. world is not perfect. The key that opened the and so the elastofragmentoblast uh, that we can see here with its female uh, and the nemochrome and the spirothermophage and the uh, reverse iconocycle uh, and the electricia and the millefolio, all of them explain why the world is not perfect. It's because of the quarks. That's uh, very simple. Um, some people talk about angels that could make the world better. And the quarks are not uh, devils. They are just uh, disturbing the logic of things and maybe our simple daily life expectations. So uh, the question is, when I was working on CGI, doing animation and, and taking some time up to one day to render one image and one month to render one second, uh, I understood that something was missing that we call now real time. And another thing that comes from real time, that means real time is a possibility to get uh, the, the, the image and the sound at the time it is produced without any delay. The other thing was virtuality. And I, I have to say a few words about virtuality. Uh, virtuality is uh, the fact that uh, things have a potential evolution before they become actual. So uh, if uh, you remove virtuality from reality, then we are stuck before the Big Bang. 
and which is a bit disappointing because I wouldn't be here to talk to you and you wouldn't be here to listen to me. And so virtuality is something that, of course, exists in, uh, permanently in the world, but didn't exist in, in uh, image representation and sound recording uh, because they are all based on the recording of something that happened, but not on the revelation that something that could happen later. So I started making, a, a, in 92, I proposed to make a project called Art After Museum. And this, uh, this has nothing to do, I don't know if you see the screen. Do you see the Google Drive thing in the top? Okay, you don't see it, good. Um, Art After Museum was a collection of VR works by contemporary artists. I proposed in 92, um, and uh, this helped me, helped me to start working on, uh, on VR. And so I thought, okay, if I do something with VR, uh, should I consider the VR space as full or empty? That sounds like a very uh, rhetorical question, but uh, actually it's a real thing. And so we have to consider what is the next shift from real time to immersion. So if you can produce sound and image in real time, uh, what does it mean to get immersed? Suddenly, you see the world from inside the artwork. Instead of watching it like a painting on the wall, that could be something like a window. So if we uh, start with the very first thing I did with VR, it was a big question. So uh, I consider that art is more about questions than answers. We are not bringing answers. We are just helping people to see the question. And so the first of the big question was it got flat in 94. And it's got flat is just a world full of bricks. And when we move in this world, we see we dig corridors by moving. And we understand that we have a kind of freedom, apparent freedom. Then we discover pictures floating in this world that are actually pictures of gods as we're presenting in art history. And it takes time to discover that there is, if we are free to dig corridors, there is no exit in this world. So the big question, second big question was, is the devil curved? In 95, using AI, to discover a world full of sky. Uh, when I say full of sky, I mean that if you dig corridors in the sky, it becomes different. And you may discover the entity that lives in the sky that is actually an autonomous entity made of five spheres uh, with a kind of specific behavior. And you discover the behavior here because we are coming closer to it. And as you can see, this is a very simple thing made of five spheres. And it, it takes time to us to discover that we give it pleasure by coming closer. So uh, to understand the, the project, you have to understand that actually this is the metaphor of the media primetime programs on TV, for example, trying to seduce you by all means. And for that, they are able to modify themselves and to modify their structure until they please a larger audience. So this thing is trying to seduce me and for that produce the appropriate sounds and the shape of the five spheres will change and the shape and color according to time in order uh, to get more and more people interested in. And this, is, was, this is, was commissioned by Canal Plus TV channel in France. And, and uh, on the booth in Imagina, I presented this as a kind of critical metaphor 
of uh, how TV channels work with seduction and people. Then the same year, the question was, is it about immersion or about connecting people? We have to say that this is also the year where uh, internet and the web, the web started being very efficient. And so the tunnel under the Atlantic was something between the Pompidou Center in Paris and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Montreal. And people had the possibility to dig uh, through cultural matter in order to meet each other. And they could dig in very complex spaces. And, and you can see what you see has been dug before. And your voice gives direction for the other one to come to you. And the other one is somebody from the other side of the Atlantic. So that's 6,000 kilometers away. And it took five days to, for the first meeting. Of course, people could talk before, but they couldn't see each other. So that was, that was uh, the, the point. And of course, to make possible the, the digging, you had uh, the video in the space. And this is the first meeting after five days of digging. Matthew, we can see you in Montreal. Everybody says hi. I can see you. I can see you. You're dressed in red with a white color. And this is exactly what this project was about. It was about what does it mean to get in touch with people very far away if first you don't know them and second you don't have something special to tell them. But in the Pompidou Center, people used to come every day, one or two hours, and come the day after to be there at the time of the meeting. And so uh, we have to understand now that uh, immersion is one thing, but integration, the fact that the spectator becomes an active component of the work is probably another important mutation. So everything we see in the tunnel is the result of the experience of people who want to meet each other. So I did many other versions. I'm not going to show that because this one will take too much time. In 2016, we celebrated the 20 years of the tunnel under the Atlantic. So we created this show at, in Osage Gallery, Hong Kong, uh, where, called Just Dig It, where uh, we built different uh, different tunnels, but it was more skeletons of tunnels, like the skeletons of, of uh, elephants, uh, because we don't need any more to hide the projector. Uh, when in 95, we had to find a trick uh, to project uh, in daylight. And this is a borders tunnel, uh, and this is a color tunnel. And these tunnels are all about obstacles to communication that we have to get through to dig through. And, and this is why they have a certain materiality, but at the same time, they are addressing some social political question. Then the next mutation is for, in, from integration to situation. And this, for example, could be World Skin, a photo safari in the land of war in 97, where people were invited, a group of people were invited to get in a world made of photos of the Second World War and the Bosnia War. And so they had a physical camera in the hand, and if they took photos with a physical camera, they were actually catching the photo that will be printed out afterwards. And then at the same time, they were erasing the traces, leaving white ghosts in this landscape. So this was commissioned by Ars Electronica in 97, and got the, got the Nika Award in 98. Uh, uh, what is interesting is the collective experience. So when you take something, you remove the possibility for the other to take it or to see it. It's like if creating memory is the best way to erase, uh, to erase memory. 
And so here you see the cave, because th this was made in the cave first, and then it was made in a, in a uh, this was uh, then uh, made in a single screen, very wide, so you take all the field of view, and it has been presented in many countries around the world, but not in Italy yet. And you see it's a collective experience, uh, because people make a competition, uh, try to get something, until they discover, until they discover the reality of what they are doing, which is not positive, it's not a video game, you know, really, it's real people that were recorded by the military photographers at this time. So this is a kind of prints that come from world skin and you see that the traces of what has been erased has been converted into white spaces and white shadows and so the experience uh, you you have in certain situation uh, may be different if we can really share something that usually you don't share like watching and art impact was about watching uh, artworks from different from another place. So in the Pompidou Center, I offered the people the possibility to see the opening, to see a show in Avignon about beauty curated by Jean de Loisy. And this show uh, was not open yet. And in the Pompidou Center, it was possible to see it. And people used to have binoculars, VR binoculars. And they were actually, uh, when they were painting with a glaze. Uh, with a gaze when they were watching. And so everybody watching at the same time would interfere and modify the palimpsest of the experience of watching. And some other places, not only the exhibition place, but also supermarket, sort of house, were also in competition with artworks in terms of retinal selection. Cosmopolis in 2005, the other world in 2000, Cosmopolis in 2005 used more sophisticated binoculars uh, because it was made for China. So we had 12 screens, 12 telescopes, and people could see panoramas from 12 cities around the world to understand how the evolution of building cities uh, happened and why. This is Shanghai 2005. And so we use exactly like in, in Art Impact, the collective retinal memory, the way that we can share the fact of watching uh, and, uh, and to share it in a way that we are painting by watching. And never before, I think it happened, that we share really what we see or what we look at. And, and the, the binoculars and the telescope allow uh, to have more intentionality, more intention in what you do. And so the mix of 12 cities, of course, create another city, uh, which is called here Cosmopolis. And this is a real show before it goes to, to China. And you see that people, the light is on people because everything is about people. Science Museum in Shanghai, where we got up to 10,000 people coming every day. So uh, that was a kind of a big, big audience. And everybody enjoying, and at the same time painting, you see on the, on the screen, this is not just the objective vision of what we see. And I really loved how people, families come with babies. And the opening of the, in Chongqing, of the uh, Three Gorge Museum, which is, was a very nice opening, probably my biggest opening, uh, because it was also the opening of the museum. This was the exhibition for the opening of the museum. And so you see the, the people, I met plenty of photos of uh, people in action, and I really love this uh, experience. So you'll see the collective retinal memory at the end of the experience. And this is the exhibition scenes from the top. And from immersion to perversion, uh, New Horizon is more uh, something for the street. So it's an urban media installation. And uh, I have to make it shorter because I'm sure I'm late. So it was in Shanghai and Pudong, in Pudong, Century Avenue, 
and I installed big uh, uh, sculptures like that where people could look inside to be converted into QR codes. And so the, 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 what they call the ID wall were actually swallowing the idea of people. And, and so uh, they could get a QR code corresponding to them, like if there would be, there would be commodities. But in the middle of the show, you had a big screen uh, where uh, the city was growing. And this growing city was paved with the QR code of people. So this was a city made by people, and the materiality of the city was still people, even if most of the people building the city don't live in these buildings, of course, afterwards. They have to go back to the countryside. So pervasion to critical vision, when art invades the city, it's also to bring another vision, which is the artist's vision, helping to decrypt reality uh, through forms of fictions. And emotion forecast is uh, from the series of mechanics of emotions. And uh, it was based on, on uh, uh, Bloomberg's uh, TV, the way to say what is the emotional state of the world today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow. And so uh, here you see it was in Paris and it has been presented in something like 20 countries around the world. Uh, of course, my dream was to have it on TV like the weather forecast, but this uh, uh, didn't happen, unfortunately. And the data was com were coming from the web. Occupy Wall Screen was in New York, close to Wall Street during the Occupy movement. And it was putting side by side the emotional state of cities and, and the financial stock. And so the growing of them, oh, uh, sorry, we're supposed to see more about that. Escape Today was uh, in Seoul in 2012, taking exactly the same content and uh, putting on a big building where traders are actually working just in front of uh, uh, Seoul Station. Uh, and people could see the emotional stock compared to uh, the emotional state of the cities compared to the financial stock. Some going up, some going down, and it's all about the values. This one was called Emotionscape, but it was too big, so it became Escape today. Open Sky Project was a two or three years project in Hong Kong, on the highest building in Hong Kong, uh, close to 500 uh, meter tall and 70,000 square meters of screen, where I invited my MFA students, but also artists from all over the world to present their work. And here, this is Jim Campbell, uh, who made a project uh, that we call, you could call the Screamers, uh, where people were screaming two hours and a half every day, every night, during one month. And so you just have to imagine that there is something like 1 million or 2 million people seeing that at the same time. It's uh, like a TV channel. And the interesting thing in this action is that the political impact is not so visible, but this is like uh, swimming from, uh, from the water to the sky without being in competition. And we see there is no competition here. People are just enjoying between, to be between the sea and the sky. Oh, sorry, we already saw that. So uh, then from so uh, that come after, so we should make a break now. I'm sorry, I'm probably too long. Maurice, um, for this journey through your amazing works, but also through the most important shifts of the last decades. Uh, our discussions are uh, active on uh, Slido, and we are getting a lot of smart feedback. Um, one, uh, you can see here this word cloud. We have just asked what's the most important shift that's uh, currently happening in the art world, thanks to the digital. We have uh, different interesting answers and uh, 
as for now, co-creation is the most popular. Um, we uh, have also discussed. We have also shared with our discussants some uh, uh, question before this event, and uh, one of the key point was the physical dimension of the digital world we live in. Um, we have this uh, paradox that before, the from the artist's point of view, the art art was more physical because you had the painter, the sculpture, you had to build your work with your body too while now why now this is changing for the artists no and uh, the opposite is for the audience the audience before was very passive while now the audience becomes part of the work it's inside work what do you think about this shift from the physical to the virtual and the, the mix of both um, I, I will I, I will talk about that um uh on the next part uh, of the of the talk um the the question is not really a shift from the physical to the virtual because i tried all the time to mix them you know the tenant on that the atlantic was a physical tube here and the experience of course its experience is a, like if the experience happens in your mind so it's more the confrontation of human minds with physical reality and if you see world skin, world skin, you have a, you have a, a real physical photo camera in your hand, and you make photos in, in a kind of visual space, and at the same time you get a print on paper, and yes. this is the result of your experience. So I was more interested in the bridging of uh, of the representation and 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 uh, and, uh, and the physical world then trying to uh, figure out how the few uh, the, the the fully uh digital world could uh, take over and, and this is exactly what the most recent project i will mention after uh was uh based uh, based on so uh that's a that's a very important one so if you tell if you ask me what is the most important shift Actually, I didn't put it on words, uh, and I should have. This is, for me, the introduction of virtuality uh, into uh, the realm of um, art making. And virtuality, as I mentioned, for me, has nothing to do with the uh, digital, has nothing to do with, uh, uh, with a certain form of image. It has to do with the fact that the representation can be created at the time you see it. And then suddenly, Certainly, an artwork is not anymore a perfect composition uh, made forever, but it has become something which is uh, an organization of behaviors that allow a certain kind of dialogue opening and a specific understanding of the artist's work or okay. artist's intention. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe. Uh, in one word, your your word could also be fusion, no? Because that is your approach of fusing the virtual, real, the disciplines, and so on. So I, exactly, uh, in, in a way, I mentioned that later. So when I started working in the physical space in the city, for example, at the city scale, uh, what was really important is to understand the difference between fusion of fiction and reality, and critical fusion what I try to do, which where the fiction is not trying to hide reality, uh, like Guy Debord could have said mm. it, talking about the society of the spectacle, but actually fiction is here to make the reality visible. Obviously. And so this is some part of the reality, you know, uh, because it's already hidden mm. and, and we need, we need uh, hints and uh, we need uh, evidences of uh, uh, what's, uh, what, what is really happening. And I think the role of the artist may be to work at this level, which is in between, uh, as you yeah. say, two worlds of representation and the uh, physical, social, political world, and how these things could uh, uh, coalesce or collapse. Great. Very interesting. I think that we can uh, go in the second part of your presentation and uh, and then we will have another Q&A at the end of the lecture. Okay. I'm ready for that. Wait. 
So this is, uh, uh, this is about the most recent works I've been working on uh, for, the last, uh, for the last five years. And um, the idea was more how we can go from the soul, to, from the brain directly uh, to the representation and how, uh, how we can give shade to ideas. If you consider that artists are giving shade to ideas, how the public suddenly would be in this situation of doing that. So this was at the beginning, the Brain Factory project, uh, based on two things you can see here, uh, what, which are for me, the trends. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, should be more visible. Yeah, no, it's here. The trends which are sublimation and reification. We are at the same time trying to convert the world including ourselves, including the people, including the, uh, the galaxy and whatever, uh, we are trying to convert them into data after converting them into money, after converting them into worlds, after converting them into numbers uh, and so on. And at the same time, we would like to convert our thoughts uh, because the interest of the data is obviously uh, to be uh, to be treated uh, by natural or artificial brains. Now, if we talk about matter, we want at the same time things coming from our brain to become physical. And this is, of course, what we try to do uh, in this process between sublimation and reification, matter and data, uh, which is for me the two forces that control uh, the, let's say, the economy and even the research at different levels. So the thing is, if we talk about reification, we are talking about converting thoughts into objects, uh, which is a term coming from Marx and, and Lukács and Debord again. Uh, that is more a critical term that say that our thoughts and our values may be may vanish into objectification, into uh, reification of this. So this is freedom, it's really printed after an experience where uh, actually the public was invited to, to think about the shape and to control the shape, the evolution of the shape on a screen. And so all these are design, uh, space, freedom, and other uh, abstractions that have been converted into 3D, uh, into 3D physical objects. Then this uh, brain factory project with the intention to convert abstractions into image and objects became a different project where we decided to limit the abstractions to the human values. And so it became the value of values project, transactional art on the blockchain. So everything could go from the brain to the blockchain, as if we could figure out what is the value of thoughts, what is the value of values. And this project is about confronting, as I did before with emotions, uh, confronting uh, financial stock with uh, world emotions. This is about finance versus ethics. So it's a project uh, I did together with Tobias Klein, who has been working on the Brain Factory project with an artist working a lot with 3D printing and uh, physical construction is coming. It comes from uh, architecture background and Nicolas Mendoza with an artist who had uh, who uh, was also a PhD student at City University of Hong Kong. Tobias Klein is also teaching at City University of Hong Kong. And Nicolas Mendoza made a thesis about the comparison uh, between amulet, Thai amulets, which are symbols, religious symbols, uh, and, and uh, blockchain, uh, uh, blockchain data. And he, he came up with the idea that the process is pretty similar. And even for artworks, there may be something like values 
and even cryptocurrencies. This is a video explaining the process. So you see in shows we may be uh, have we may have different station where people watch shapes evolving generated and they react to that and their their brain is like an ecosystem where this shape has to survive according to a specific value So this was in in Hong Kong, the last Brain Factory show before starting with value of values. Uh, but the idea is similar. You see somebody is watching the evolution of the shape of justice. And at the end of the process, this will be the shape of justice. This was in Guangzhou, Korea, for ASEA last year. And then at the end of the process, you get a QR code that will be registered on the blockchain. If you download your wallet, which takes one minute, then you have immediately this token in your collection. So you become a collector and you can decide to keep it, to collect this value or to transfer it to somebody else or to swap it for another value or to sell it. And you can also sell the value to know the price of this value. Transactional poetry is a result of this experience. When you give peace to get money, it's a symbolic act. And so it's immediately converted into transactional poetry that generates automatically ethical statements inspired by actual transactions. So if you give money for love, it may become you always need more money to find love or something else. At the same time, the trading will define the actually profile of people according to their values. But also, it may tell us what is the ranking of values according to people, cities and countries. In a coming exhibition, it is planned to have also the scientists who create a periodic table of values and to classify the values according to how people collect them. So if you want money, you may want power. If you want love, you may want peace. And this proximity creates a specific periodic table of values. But you can also create a specific writing and the reader will try to interpret this writing coming from your interaction with the shape because you are saying something with the shape you are creating and the words you find may become interpreted by the interpreter that will combine them together and try to find references around that then these values can be reified so each person, when you get a specific value, like a love 230, uh, you may want to make prints, 2D prints, 3D prints, maybe, uh, maybe fashion design out of that to say, I want to share and to wear my values. But you may, wear, you may also do installation, physical installation, like this inflatable purity of this footprint of freedom in the marble of this democracy made of honeycomb or this uh, uh, even interesting the really the big reificator making big sculpture in concrete out of abstractions and then see them vanishing when it rains on them they become sand again So this is a, a show that should come uh, uh, around March 
in Hong Kong and I hope very soon in Milan as well. So this is about converting the spectacle in transaction as a form of speculative speculations and values. That mean, of course, there is a kind of humor, you understand, when you, we talk about speculative speculations. And as when we talk about value of values, we are talking about human values. And so this global art project is combining neuroscience, culture, 3D graphics, music, design, poetry, economics, fintech, and politics. So the mutation we have been talking about from the beginning is how we move from an object considered as an artwork to an artwork that behave like a subject. And then we understand that the artwork becomes a society of autonomous agents. So the spectator become, when it comes to the show, it becomes an artist, a curator, selecting, selecting relevant artworks for the topic, a collector, I keep them, an art dealer, I sell them. A trader, I try to speculate on them. But the work itself is also built of a society of agents. A generator, a calligrapher, a printer, a reader, an interpreter, a scientist, an analyst, an accountant, a poet. This is different works and different exhibitions that have been made, the brain cloud, around this topic. And this one, the brain factory at microwave festival, this is a launching of value of values during the IVO, which is initial value offering by opposition to ICO, which is what the term used for cryptocurrencies. And this is at the Art Center in so in June 5 uh, uh, last year. And uh, this was the official launching with mostly media and curators. This was in Guangzhou in Korea during ISEA 2019. This was organized by Meet and Maya Garcia Matei uh, during the uh, Baos 100 exhibition in Macerata, uh, in Macerata in Italy, and with an interesting mix of uh, classical art and, and immersive things. And at the Mocha Museum in Taipei in October, last October, we had a three station like that. And so we could have the really intensive production of uh, VOV tokens. And the VOV tokens are the one you get when you download the app and you start trading. So this is uh, the, this project is also supported by uh, the Star Lighthouse program, Mindspaces. And so I'm part of Mindspaces Europe project. And I'm also, uh, I also initiated the Mindspaces Hong Kong a uh, project which is an extension to architecture and urbanism of uh, um, the project uh, we are doing in Europe. And so plenty of uh, exciting partners. You can see Meet in the middle and many other who largely support the scene. And I really thank you for your patience and your attention. Well, thank you, Maurice. We were traveling around the world, virtual, both, and physical world with you. <laughs> and so thank you. We have a lot of questions mm -hmm. coming. And I think that maybe uh, let, let me show you some questions coming from our, let's say, social media friends. One of the questions I'd like to pose to, well, I'm the voice of the social. So one of the questions they pose from, for example, Uruguay or, uh, well, I have people following us from New York and all around the world. But let me say that also the Italian speakers can uh, well, watch us and listen to us later. We are, we are going to have this video subtitled in Italian next week, so no worries. But talking to the English speaker, one of the questions um, rise was on what is media art, the definition of media art for you now? What has changed from, well, the beginning uh, till now? Uh, the, the, the perception, um, I would okay. say, the sentiment. It's a, it's, a, it's a very difficult question. I think people use media art expression because it's a more simple. They don't say any more new media art because uh, media are always new and always renewing themselves. Uh, so I would say, if you consider what a medium used, used to be in art, 
you just understand that what we call media term McLuhan uh, is something, let's say, with a certain level of complexity. So maybe something related to the fact that uh, between what our ideas and what we express, there is a kind of complex treatment of information that use sometimes complex technologies, sometimes not. So I take very often uh, examples coming from uh, non-mediated uh, art to explain what media art is about. So yes, something happened as, uh, as something happened when electricity came uh, in society and we are not talking about electricity art. So media art is of course a big, big shift and we are talking about that and this is what I try to express. But if we are making art, we are not talking about the technology itself. We are more trying to see how it reflects contemporary society in a meaningful way, because this is where we are. Now we are not considering that the artist from the 90s coming from VR was doing something magic, uh, like, uh, Louis, uh, like Louis Lumiere was doing with cinema in, in the 80s, 1880s. So we are not considering that anymore because everybody is immersed into technology now. It's just now it belongs to our life. So we can really seriously talk again about the real stakes that are uh, actually behind the, uh, this and beyond this technology. Thank you. Oh, well, I, well, it was a flash, but I think maybe we'll, we'll come later. Well, let me, let me also, oh, well, again. So now I, I, I'm very happy to also show you, Maurice, uh, what our amazing Marcello Petruzzi is doing. He's a live sketching. Uh, it's a kind of a souvenir just to... <laughs> well, I want it. I want it. You, you'll have, you'll have. Now Thank it's you. a traditional uh, thing we do. <laughs> also, um, Nancy Proctor wanted, and we are going to send not not only online, but you know, a physical physical drawing too. So I have another question, if I can, very quickly. I think it's kind of interesting. It came from uh, the um, Twitter page. It was about Asia and how Asia had an impact on your work. And so since you are just in Hong Kong and I, I would like to know more if you want about how Asia impacted on your work. Oh, yeah, it, it's a very, very strong impact. I always consider that the fact that you move your point of view uh, and reach uh, your vision of society, you'll understand better. And everything that sounds very natural when you don't move, uh, suddenly you have to rethink and to reset your preconception of uh, of the world. So uh, Asia has been a really significant uh, move in my work. And uh, I first I was very receptive to the fact that uh, that Asian public is fantastic there. You are, yeah, as I show you before, you have families coming from yeah. from uh, for uh, to see media art exhibition. And the photos were from 2005, so I'm not talking about something that happened last week. Uh, but it's the same thing now. There is a real interest, a real weird, uh, will to discover the world and to uh, try to figure out how things are shifting. And, uh, and this is, uh, you know, I'm in Hong Kong, and uh, I used to say that the interest to be in Hong Kong is actually to uh, observe the world at the junction of the tectonics uh, of uh, political plaques. And, uh, and, and this, uh, uh, of course, cannot happen uh, without uh, any disturbance like uh, earthquakes or volcanoes. <laughs> and, and so um, this is uh, what we, we are just witnessing now. And uh, we are just waiting for what will come tomorrow and the day after. Yeah, again. So we can maybe have another another look at this amazing drawing. And uh, well, as you can see, shifting, connecting, and immersing are all the keywords of this this well, uh, souvenir. And I think that maybe we also have some other questions from Slido and Nicola. 
if Nicola is ready, I will give the stage yes, to him. Yes, we have a very active audience uh, online on our website, and uh, we have asked to our discussant to share with us some uh, digital projects who are uh, uh, more disruptive, are opening new dimension in the arts, and we have uh, some examples like uh, works by Nadini Marani, Tavoli by Studio Azzurro, uh, Machine Hallucination by Refik Canado. I don't know if you, Maurice, uh, apart from your works, if you have any, I, what, what is a digital project who is uh, opening up a new dimension, who is shifting more? Uh, of course, I've been mentioning that, um, that artworks are becoming kind of living entities, and I talk about the subjectivities on the artwork. And this probably uh, explained that I feel very close to Refik and Adol because uh, we are working on a common project. Uh, so that's uh, uh, called Dialogue that should come soon and some other around that. And, and uh, yes, AI, you know, when I presented the, 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 um, uh, the Is a Devil Curve project from 95, it was actually using an AI to observe how people behave and to decide of the evolution of the thing. Mm -hmm. And even the tunnel was using something like that to decide of the content according to uh, the people interests and so on. So uh, this is something I think we feel immediately if we are deeply into uh, a certain knowledge of the technologies and their evolution in time. And this, of course, uh, lead us to envisage or to consider uh strong evolutions in terms not of complexity but in terms of relevance and in terms of uh, of sensitivity and uh, and response yeah. and so this uh, richness of the response of the artwork uh, to the interrogation of people trying to discover them is probably one of the most exciting part of the thing now you can also have an impact on the world in a different way and this is what we try with value of values, uh, because we try to consider that people, you know, may think about what are their important values uh, just by trading symbolic values. And yeah. this thing, uh, now on the website, you can compare the values between different cities. And you can see some cities are more interested in money, some others are more interested in family and friends. And so this is something playing like a mirror that help people to understand better the society and maybe to decide to shift society as well uh, by changing uh, the relative value of values and all the perception people have of how they feel the world. Yeah. Um, you have already um, replied, discussed about this topic, but we have a lot of questions about the experience of art in a digital world. So we have a question like, uh, how important is uh, empathy in the process of uh, sublimation and reification? Or uh, what the most, one more direct is, what is immersion from your point of view? Or how to balance the public and private experience, for example, in a public space? Um, what do you think it's the most, um, yeah, what, 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 what do you think it's the most uh, uh, important part of the experience that, uh, uh, for example, people attending your works are doing? It's about empathy, it's about uh, immersion, it's about changing their point of view? Uh, it's actually, in a way, it's merging uh, with the work. Uh, I mean, the empathy is, of course, how the work is defined. It's, the work is defined to understand better the people. And to understand the better the people is not to convince the people of doing something. It's not to convince the people that some truth is mm -hmm. coming. It's just uh, doing what uh, Plato was call calling and, uh, and Socrates was calling a uh, meiotic. And so the, the meiotic, you know, the fact that you give birth to a form of truth that come from you because it's already inside you. I say I believe in that more than anything else. So I wouldn't make a form of art trying to convince people of something. I just want to draw attention to some aspect of uh, our coexistence with technologies uh, uh, in order to 
to, to get something out of that. So empathy, of course, is something very important because that means, because if you decide that the artwork as a form of empathy with the artist, that means the artwork is able to perceive the, uh, with the public, I mean, the yeah. artwork is supposed to perceive uh, the public and the artwork is supposed to understand the public and the behavior and even maybe a bit of the psychology of the public. And yeah. the artwork is supposed to react as we dialogue uh, between us and we try to say things uh, to be understood by the other or not. And even the fact not to be understood is something that is an interpretation of uh, what the author is trying to express. So all this thing is totally new. The fact that the artwork is paying, paying attention to the audience and try to establish a certain uh, um, a, a connection, an interaction of a certain level, uh, this is a strong mutation of not only uh, technology in art, but uh, also evolution of society. Yeah. Because what I say about the artwork is true about most of the tools that surround us now. Yeah. It's also what at the meet we want to do. It's uh, going beyond these uh, boundaries to, to bridge together different worlds and also to be more uh, empathetic with our audience, with the people following us. And um, I think that uh, we are done with the questions and I can now pass the word to Maya Grazia, if uh, she's around. Yeah, here you are. Hello. Uh, Thank you, Maurice. Merci. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, so inspiring. Uh, I think it's very it's important to invite you again uh, next year in Milano with exhibition too, and uh, to continue to, to talk about that because uh, it's so impressive. And, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Lorenza, tu hai ancora qualcosa da Yes, I have another question if I can. I'd like to know what's the next project you're working on, Maurice, if we can know, <laughs> if it's not secret. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of, the, some of them are not secret. So I mentioned briefly the project we are working on with Refik uh, for the Mindspaces uh, European project, mm -hmm. uh, which is dialogue, which is, uh, let's say, to make it short, is about two artworks that are like uh, living entities trying to understand each other. So it's about and communication. They are disturbed by people coming in the middle of that. Mm -hmm. So how the communication, how, how is that these artworks are literally immigrants mm -hmm. and they try to understand the world they are, they're just uh, uh, falling in and they, uh, they have to interpret many things and it's about the complexity of the dialogue and the complexity of uh, knowing a culture which is not used and understanding somebody that speaks a different language, even if it's a visual language. So that, that's one of the projects. And, and there are some other crazy projects, it's difficult to say, but one is to apply, let's say, this technology of neurodesign uh, to architecture and urbanism and to make uh, even art installation out of that, but also real, uh, real design of physical object, just using the brain not as a tool of design, but using the brain as a tool of assessment. Hmm. You know, you know I can explain that very easily uh, for people who just wonder what, what do I mean with <laughs> such obvious terms and so on. So let's say, uh, if, if I ask people to design, to say, oh, this is a sheet of paper, can you draw the car you dream of? And so you get the drawing and you say, okay, I do this car, lucky you. No, no, please don't do that. But if you ask people to choose between two or three cars, they will. They will know. They will know what they want. So the assessment I'm talking about is considering that the brain is an ecosystem. And the shape is actually a living being that has to survive in this ecosystem. Mm. Yeah. And uh, this is a kind of, uh, it's, I think it's quite original approach in terms, of, uh, in terms of design. And this is why we started with abstractions instead of starting with cars. As you can see, it was much easier. Uh, 
but uh, conceptually speaking, it's uh, it's much more exciting, of course. And, yeah, yeah. and uh, this is where we go. I'm not, not telling more because I, I always have plenty of uh, direction, but this may uh, show the line. Okay. Yes, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maurice. I think uh, it's very interesting to explore with you again next year during this. Uh, it continues to explore the digital dimension, artistic digital dimension. Uh, I'm so happy because you and uh, Refik, you are my friend and we work together for STARS too. Uh, do, do, no, so it's very... It's, it's very important because uh, uh, the word uh, anyway is a small word. Anyway, I would like to thank you, <laughs> you. Uh, thank you to my team. Thank you also to the participant of this uh, uh, meeting in Digital Innovation for Culture. And uh, um, I would like to just uh, remember the next step, if possible, to announce the next step because the, uh, we we try to discuss with the Fjord, uh, Fjord the Trends 2020. Uh, this is the next uh, meeting with the, our format Meet Media Guru Focus Online in cooperation with Accenture, 21 uh, July. Uh, or, or, <laughs> of course, uh, in a virtual. Uh, uh, environment in virtual building uh, meetcenter.hit. So, thank you for your kind of participation, for your generous, uh, Mar Maurice, uh, for your generous uh, talk. Uh, have a good evening. Ciao. And for Maurice, have a good night, Maurice, because for <laughs> you. Yeah, that, thank you very uh, much. Yes, it's, it? past, uh, it's uh, midnight, uh, 12 midnight. past midnight. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for <laughs> thank so you. I may, I may have been a bit sleepy. Good night. Okay, Good night, okay. See you. Bye, See you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.